Screw it, let's do it. Lessons in life, written by Richard Branson, narrated by Manavardin Lakarnwal, and uploaded on Barya.com on YouTube. Introduction. The press called me and my partners at Virgin Mavericks in Paradise. There is no doubt that we tend to do things in a less stuffy way than most businesses. And I have ended up with two tropical islands to have fun on. So it must be true. And for me it works. I work hard and I play hard. Though I have never followed the rules at every step, I have learned many lessons along the way. My lessons in life started at home when I was young. They carried on at school and in business from as early as my teens when I ran to student magazine. I am still learning and hope I never stop. These lessons have done me good throughout my life. I have written them down and I hope that you will find something in these pages that you might that might inspire you. I believe in goals. It's never a bad thing to have a dream, but I'm practical about it. I don't sit daydreaming about things that are impossible. I set goals and then work out how to achieve them. Anything I want to do in life, I want to do well and not half-heartedly. At school, I found reading and writing hard. Back then, dyslexia was under, wasn't understood and my teacher just thought I was lazy. So, taught myself to learn things by heart. Now I have a very good memory and it has become one of my best tools in business. When I was starting out in life, things were more certain than they are these days. You had a career lined up, often the same one your father followed. Most mothers stayed at home. Today nothing is sure and life is one long struggle. People have to make choices if they are to get anywhere. The best lesson I have learned was to just do it. It doesn't matter what it is or how hard it might seem. As the ancient Greek Plato said, the beginning is the most important part of any work. A journey of a thousand miles starts with first step. If you look ahead to be the end and all the weary miles between, with all the dangers you might face, you might never take that first step. In whatever it is you want to achieve in life, if you don't make the effort, you won't reach your goal. So take the first step. There will be many challenges. You might get knocked down back. But in the end, you will make it. Good luck. Richard Branson Chapter 1 Just do it. Believe it can be done. Have goals. Live full to full. Never give up. Prepare well, have faith in yourself, help each other. The staff at Virgin have a name for me. It's Dr. Yes. They call me this because I won't say no if I find more reasons to do things than not to do them. My motto really is screw it, let's do it. I'll never say I can't do this because I don't know how to. I'll give it a go. I won't let silly rules stop me. I will find a legal way around them. I'll tell my staff, if you want to do it, just do it. That way we all benefit. The staff's work and ideas are valued and virgin gains from their input and drive. I don't believe that that little word can't should stop you. If you don't have the right experience to reach your goal, look for another way in. If you want to fly, Get down to the airfield at the age of 16 and make this team. Keep your eyes open, look and dream. You don't have to go to art schools to be a fashion designer. Just join a, just join a fashion company and push a broom. Work your way up. My mom Eve is a perfect example of this. During the war, she wanted to be pilot. She wanted to Heston Airfield. She went to Heston Airfield and asked for a job. She was told only men could be pilots. Mom was very pretty and had been a dancer on stage. She didn't look like a man, 
That didn't stop her. She wore a leather flying jacket, hid her blonde hair under a leather helmet. Talk, she talked with a deep voice and she got the job she wanted. She learned how to glide and began to teach the new pilots. These were the young men who flew fighter planes in the Battle of Britain. After the war, she wanted to be an air hostess. Back then, they had to speak Spanish and be trained as nurses. But mom chatted up the night porter at the airline and he secretly put her name on the list. Soon she was an air hostess. She still couldn't speak Spanish and she wasn't a nurse. But she had used her wits. She wouldn't say no, she just did it. Mom wasn't the only person in our family who said, let's do it. The famous explorer, Captain Robert Scott, was my grandson's cousin. He was a man of great courage. He made two trips to the Antarctic. His goal was to be the first man to the South Pole. People said it couldn't be done. He said, I can do it, and he nearly did it. He reached the South Pole, but he was second. Roald and Mendelssohn got there first. It was a great blow for Scott. He died on the return journey. When people say there are no prizes for being second, I think of him. He's famous for being second to the South Pole. He also made the first balloon flight over Antarctica, but people don't remember that. I started student magazine when I was 15 years old and still at school. Some people said I couldn't do it. They said I was too young and had no experience, but I wanted to prove them wrong and I believed it could be done. I did my sums with care. I worked out how much the paper and print bill would be. Then I worked out the income from sales and from selling advertising space. Mom gave me four pounds for stamps. My school friend Johnny James and I spent almost two years writing hundreds of letters trying to sell space. I also tried to get interviews with famous people. Writing those letters and waiting for the replies was more fun than, than Latin lessons. It gave me a huge buzz when we got our first check for advertising space. It was 250 euros, a huge amount. My belief had paid off. I wasn't very good at passing exams at school. I knew it would do better on my own in the world. My parents let me make that choice. That were behind me whatever I did, so I left school when I was 16 to work full-time on student. Johnny and I camped out in the basement of his parents' London house. It was great to be young and free and in London. We drank beer, had girlfriends. We drank beer, had girlfriends and listened to loud music. We were like students who didn't have to study. We worked just as hard though. I got some first-rate interviews with John Lennon, Mike Jagger, Vanessa Redgrave and Daley Murray. We had more famous names than, more, than some of the top magazines. Famous people started dropping by. Life in the basement was glorious chaos. It was like a non-stop party. But we had a serious side as well. We sent our own people out to cover the big issues of the day like the war in Vietnam and the famine in Bifra. We felt we were changing things. What we did was important as well as fun. We were a close night team. Even my family helped to be the park and sold them there. Each time a chance came, we grabbed it. We branched out by being the first people to sell cut price records by mail order. The first advert went in the last edition of Student. When a postal strike stro stopped us, we looked for another way. We wouldn't give in. Our goal was to open record shops, but we didn't have m enough money. So we talked a man who owned a shoe shop into letting us use his spare space. We worked hard to promote the opening. We made the store a cool place for students to go. And one store led to a second and a third. Soon we had stores in almost every big town and I was still under 20 years old. Cash was pouring in fast, but I didn't sit back. We had reached that target, but I still had more goals. 
One of my big goals in life is that like Captain Scott, I have always wanted to li live life to the full. So in 1984, when I was asked to sponsor a power boat to win the Blue Ribbon for Britain, I agreed to it at once. The Blue Ribbon is a prize for the fastest ocean crossing from America to Ireland. I said I joined the crew and trained hard. There was only one slight hitch. John and I were due to have a baby and I had promised her that I would be there for the birth. Then we were told that the weather was just right for the record attempt. I would let, the, I would let down the team if I didn't go. I asked John what shall I do. Just do it. Go, she said. The baby is not due for two weeks. You will be back before then. We set off crashing the, across the waves in Virgin Atlantic Challenger. At the end of the first day, I got the news that my son Sam had been born. We cracked open the, ch the champagne and kept going. The prize for the fastest crossing ever was within our grasp until we hit a huge storm off Ireland. 60 miles from the end, we were hit by a giant wave. The hull split and we sank. Mayday, mayday, mayday. We were in the sea in the middle of storm in a life raft. A boat was on its way to America, saved us. We had failed in our first attempt to win the Blue Ribbon, but we didn't give in. Six years later, I was back with Virgin Atlantic Challenger 2. Things were going well until we found that seawater was getting into our fuel tanks. The engines stopped. We spent hours cleaning the tanks and trying to start engines. It seemed hopeless. The others at last said we had to give up. They said it was over, but I knew it was our last try. If we didn't do it now, we would never do it. I persuaded them not to give in. I said, come on, we have got to do it. Let's try. We were all done in. Our eyeballs were red and tired. We were all seasick. We hated the boat. We hated the sea. We wanted to sleep for a week. We have got we've got to go on I yelled all right I agreed we will give it one last shot somehow we started the engines and got going again it seemed hopeless we were so far behind there that there seemed little point in trying but we kept on going we made off time in the end we beat the record by just two hours and nine minutes but we did it the lesson I learned from that in that I live by is to keep trying and to never give up. The day after we won the Blue Ribbon, a Swede named Per Lindstrand asked me to cross Atlantic again in a hot air balloon. I thought my old hero, Captain Scott, he had flown in a balloon over the South Pole. I had never been in a balloon before. No one had ever flown that far in a balloon before. It was mad. It was too risky. By then my companies were dealing in hundreds of millions of pounds. What would happen if I died? There were many problems, but I can't resist a, ch a challenge and the chance to try something new. I said, screw it, let's do it. But first I asked her, I asked Per, do you have any children? Yes, he said, I've got two. That was good enough for me. If he would take the challenge, so would I. I shook his hand and said I would join him. I always tell people that if they want to do anything well, they must plan and prepare. So I went to the Spain with her with Per and learned to fly in a balloon. I didn't know it then, but those lessons saved my life. One of the things I learned was that each hot air balloon carries fuel, which is burned to heat the air in the balloon. Hot air arises and so does the balloon. When the fuel is not burned, the air cools and the balloon drops lower in the sky. When flying a hot air balloon, the pilot must heat or cool the air so that the balloon is at the right level to catch the wind going in the direction the balloon needs to go. The winds and the jet stream blow from America to Europe. We left from America and 29 hours later we were over island Ireland. we were the first to cross the atlantic in a hot air balloon there was only one problem how to land 
we had some fuel tanks and left and it was too dangerous to land with them. We might crash and burn. We chose to come down low and drop the tanks in a field. We reduced the flame in the air balloon and came down low. We cut the tanks free, but then we were too light. We bounced across a field and shot up into the sky, out of control. Let's come down on the beach, where we won't hurt people, per se. We flew into thick fog and missed the beach. The sea looked very black and stormy. If we landed it in with balloon, we could drown. I struggled into my life jacket. Suddenly from around 56 feet up, Per jumped into the icy sea without his weight. The balloon shot up too high for me to jump. I was on my own. I floated higher and higher into the clouds. The winds took me north towards Scotland. I was alone flying in the biggest balloon ever built. I had about an hour of fuel left. When it went, I would fall into the sea. I tried the radio. It was dead. I didn't know what to do. I could jump out in my parachute or stay out. I wrote in my notebook, Juan, Holly, Sam, I love you. While I'm alive, I, could, I can still do something. I said to myself, something will turn up. Something did. As the balloon drifted towards the gray sea, I came out of the clouds and saw a helicopter. It was searching for me. I waved and the crew waved back. I was safe. Close to the waves, I jumped into the sea away from the balloon without my weight. It flew up and out of sight. The helicopter fished me out of the icy water. I asked about Per, but they had thought he was with me. He had been in the sea for hours. We had to find him quickly. I told them where he would be and he was rescued just before he froze to death. The whole trip was an amazing experience. I learned many lessons, not just if you want to do something, just do it, but also to prepare well, have faith in yourself, help each other, never give up. All of these lessons can be used in life. You don't have to run a big business, fly in a balloon or break records in a boat to learn from and use the lessons I learned. Your goal can be small. Student magazine was very small at first. I sold space in it from a payphone at school because I believed it I could and I would do it. If something is what you really want to do, just do it. Whatever your goal is, you will never succeed unless you let go of your fears and fly. The end of chapter 1. Chapter 2. Have fun. Have fun, work hard and money will come. Don't waste time, grab your chances, have a positive outlook on life. When it's not fun, move on. I don't deny that I have done well in hard success. It has even been said that I turn that I touch into gold. People ask me what my secret is, how do I make money? What they really want to know is how can they make money? Everyone wants to be a millionaire. I always tell them the same thing. I have no secret. There are no rules to follow in business. I just work hard and as always have done. Believe I can do it. Most of all, though, I try to have fun. When I was about to go around the world in a hot air balloon in 1997, I knew that it was very risky. I might not return. Before I left, I wrote a letter to my children, Sam and Holly. In it, I said, live life to the full, enjoy every minute of it, love and look after mom. These were, those words sum up what I believe in. Don't waste time, have fun, love your family. Notice that making money isn't in that list. I didn't set out to be rich. The fun and the challenge in life were what I wanted and still do. I don't deny that money is important. We are not cavemen and women. We can't live just on roots and berries. We live in an era when, when we must have some money to survive. I said, Once I said I only need one breakfast, one lunch and one dinner a day. And I still live by those words. I never went into business to make money. But I have fun, I have found fun, that if I have fun, the money will come. 
I often ask myself, is my work fun and does it make me happy? I believe that the answer to that matters more than fame or fortune. If something stops me stops being fun, I ask why. If I can fix it, I stop doing it. You might ask, how do I know that fun will lead to money? Of course it doesn't always happen. I have had my downs as well as ups. But on the whole I have been very lucky for almost as long as I remember. I have had fun and I have made money. My very first business lessons weren't success but I learned from them. My first money making scheme was when I was about 9 years old. One Easter I came up with a great plan. I would grow Christmas trees. I asked my best friend Nick Powell to help me plant 400 seeds in our field at home. We worked hard but also enjoyed ourselves. We enjoyed messing about on the farm. We all we had to do was wait for the seeds to turn into Christmas trees. It would take 18 months. The first thing I had to learn was how to use figures. I was not good at sums at school. One paper they made no sense, but as I planned our Christmas tree business, I used real sums that we make sense. The bag of seeds cost just 5 euros and we would sell each tree for 2 euro. We would make 795 euros, which was worth waiting for. Even at an early age, I planned long term and planned to wait for reward. My second lesson was that money doesn't grow on trees. Sadly, rabbits are all the settlings. We got some revenge, though I'm sorry to say we had fun shooting the rabbits. We sold them for shelling each to the local butcher. Overall, we did, a, we did make a small profit and all our friends had rabbit pie. We all gained something. You never know what you will find on a sunny beach. On holiday, I found my very own desert island in an airline. In 1976, I was looking and building up Virgin Music. Mike Oldfield had already been our first big success with Tobler Bills in 1973. We also signed up the Sex Pistols so things were on the up. We were very busy but we also had a great deal of fun. People said things like Branson's Lucky Devils come to cro across a huge hit like Tobler's Bells. Yes, it was Lucky Brick, but we grabbed it. It had been taken to every other record company. They had turned it down, but we heard it and believed in it. We knew it would happen. Making it work was hard for a bunch of kids like us, though we had to find the money. We had to push it to the top. We had to think differently. We asked John Peel to play the entire album on his show and he did. It had never been done before and it worked. Sales took off. Mike Oldfield was too shy to promote the album. We found an answer. We made a video and showed it on TV. Our big breakthrough was when we got it used at the soundtrack of the Exorc Cest. Sales were massive. We were success, but we never stopped looking for new sounds and new talent. By the end of 1977, I needed a break. My girlfriend, Juan, and I had split off. I was sad, but I liked to make the best of things. I always like to get away from London in the winter. Music, sun, and sea make me feel good. The distance from London gives me the space and freedom to think and plan out fresh ideas. I went to Jamaica. It was part holiday, part work. I swam in a warm sea. I sat on the beach. I listened to some great rag bands. Then we heard new kind of music. It was made, made by local DJs and radio jocks who were known as toasters. It was a kind of early rap, so I was in the start of something big. Jamaican musicians wouldn't take checks, so I signed up almost 20 rags bands and some toasters from a cast filled with cash. We went on to sell lots of records with them. It was a perfect example of my motto, have fun and the money will come. I was still in Jamaica when Juan phoned me out of the blue. Can you meet me in New York? She said. We had a happy time in New York City, but the phone didn't stop ringing. We longed to escape and spend some time alone. As someone asked me if I had named Virgin after the Virgin Islands, 
The answer was no. We had named the company Virgin because we were Virgin in business. But I had never been to the Virgin Islands and this sounded like the perfect romantic place for Juan and me. I had spent all our cash on signing up bands in Jamaica, but I had heard that if you were looking for a house on, the, on an island, you would get a grand tour, free of charge. I phoned an estate agent in the British Virgin Islands. I said I owned a record company and wanted to buy an island to build a story on it. Please come as our guests. We have lots of lovely islands for sale. We'll show you around. Juan and I flew to the British Virgin Islands. We were treated like royalty. A big car met us at the airport and took us to Vela. It was like being in paradise. The next day a helicopter was waiting to, uh, to take us on a tour. We skimmed over green palm trees in Blue Sea. We landed one lovely island after the other. We toured fantastic private estates and had a great time. We spun our free holiday out as long as we could. But at last we were running out of islands for sale. We asked the agent if he had something that we hadn't seen. Yes, there is one. A real little jewel, he said. It smiles from anywhere and it's quite unspoiled. Its name is Necker. He said an English lord owned it, a man who had never been there. An island that was miles from anywhere sounded good on two counts. The first was it was a nice long flight with plenty of scenery for us to enjoy. The second was we really did the sound of it. Unspoiled mean that it had been built it had it had not been built on. Perhaps it would be cheap. At first island hopping was a game, but we didn't mean to buy an island. I didn't think I could afford one. But now I was excited. I wanted to own our own place in paradise. I had another goal. We flew our blue sea and could see pal sand at the bottom. We landed on a white sandy beach. There was a green hill in the middle and we climbed up it. The view from the top was worth the effort. We could see in every direction. The island was inside a coral reef. The white beach ran almost all the way around. The agent told us that turtles laid their eggs on the beach. The sea was so clear we could see a giant ray swimming along. In the middle of the island were two small lakes. There was, there was a lush tropical forest. A flock of black parrots flew overhead. There were no big valleys. It was a real desert island. Standing there, gazing out to sea, I was king of all I saw. I fell in love with the necker on the spot. The agent warned us that there was no fresh water on the island. If we bought it, we would have to make it from the sea. Good, I thought. They can't be asking for a lot of desert island with no water, no house. I asked him the price. Three million pounds, he said. It was far beyond my reach. I can offer one lakh and fifty thousand pounds, I replied. I was offering less than five percent of asking price. I was about... I was serious, but the agent wasn't amused. The price is three million pounds, he repeated. Final offer, I can go to two million, I said. We walked back down that hill and got into the helicopter. Flew back to the villa, our bags were waiting outside. We had been thrown out. We spent the night in a bed and breakfast in the village and left the next day. We spent the rest of our holiday on another island. Our plan was to travel into Puerto Rico. But, where, but when we got to the airport, the flight was cancelled. People were roaming about, looking lost. No one was doing anything, so I did someone had to. I chartered a plan for 2,000 euro. I divided that by the number of people. It came out to 39 ahead. I borrowed a blackboard and wrote on it. I borrowed a blackboard and wrote on it Virgin Airways, 39 single flights to Puerto Rico. The idea of Virgin Airways was burned right in the middle of holiday, although the actual airline were only properly took off when I was sent a business idea. I had never chartered a plan before, but, uh, but as with tubular bells in the Jamaican toasters, I saw and grabbed the chance. And look at Virgin Atlantic today. We fly to 30 places around the world. We have Virgin Blue in Australia, Virgin Express in Europe, and Virgin Nigeria. 
We are planning Virgin America and we have even gone farther. Virgin Galactic will offer flights into space. No one else is doing that. It's a bold move. We are ahead of everyone. In 21 years, we have gone from renting a plane to space travel. Back in London with Juan after our holiday, I still had my goal to buy Necker Island. I did some research. I found that the owner of Necker was not rich, which is why he had never developed an island. I also found that he wanted to sell it hurry so he could raise two million to build house in London. It was the same sum I had offered the agent. It seemed that my offer was meant to be. The only problem was I didn't have two million pounds, so I was going to have to borrow it from someone. I offered one million seventy uh, seven lakh fifty thousand, which I didn't have either. It was turned down. I left it at that and got on the work. Three months later, I got a call to say the island was not mine. If I offered one lack in 80,000 euros. I was told that as an art of the deal I had to build a house and a plan to make the salt out of the sewer so that we could use it within five years. This would cost a lot but I was positive I could find the money somewhere to do it and agree to, to the terms. Now all I had to do was find the money to buy the island of my dreams. It seemed out of reach but I vowed to my, re my goal. I promised myself that I would make enough money to pay for the island, which I did, by taking on loans from the bank and borrowing from my friends and family. So while it doesn't have to be buying an island, this is why I can say have fun and money will come, and in turn so will your goals. Today Necker is a lovely place, where all my friends and family gather together to relax and play. The last episode of my TV series, The Rebel Billionaire, was filmed there. The camera filmed from the terrace. It showed our wonderful view of the sea, the white sandy beach and the palm trees. It was the same view that Juan and I saw from the top of that green hill and all those years ago. I signed up bands, Jamaica ended up with an airline and an island. It, was, it wasn't always easy, but when you have goals and have a positive outlook on life, you have something to aim for. Hard work and fun is what life is all about. As soon as something stops being fun, I think sometimes to move on. Life is too short to be unhappy. Walking up stressed and desirable is not a good way to live. I found this out years ago in my working relationship with my oldest friend, Nick Paul. Nick was with me from the very start of the Virgin. I was, I was the... I was the ideas person and Nick kept the books in order and handle, handled the money. His main job was to run the Virgin Record stores. They did very well. When we started airline, we wanted to be the best. We sank millions of pounds into our main rival. British Airways tried to stop us. As the war between us heated up, we needed more and more money. It seemed an endless pit. Virgin Music was wealthy, but the airline was eating up the cash. Nick didn't enjoy taking such huge risks. That was when we both knew it was time for him to move on. I thought his shares in Virgin from him. I bought his shares in Virgin from him, sorry. Nick's first love had always been films. He used his profit from Virgin to start Twelve Palace Pictures. He made great films like The Company of Wolves, Mona Lisa and The Crying Game, which won Oscar. He is still in the film business, still having fun and we are still friends. After a struggle, the airline finally went into profit. If Nick had stayed with Virgin, he might have made more money, but he would not have been happy. If we, if we had gone on working together even after the fun had gone, we might not have stayed friends. He made, the, he made the right choice. This is why I say never just try to make money. Long term success will never come if profit is the only aim. I have been lucky. Virgin now has the luxury of a great deal of money behind it. People say I should relax. I could retire. I ask, what would I do? He say, hey say, paint watercolors, play golf, have fun. But I am already having fun. My work is fun. Fun is the core of the way I do business. It has been the key to it all from the start. I see no reason to change it. Not all of us have the money to start up a business or the luck or the chances aren't there. Sometimes you are just glad to have a job, any job, so you grab the job in the factory or the store or the call center. You might hate it, but you try to make the best of things. But is that fun? 
I would I would say do you really have to stay stuck in a rut is that job you really is that job you hate really your only pro option whoever you are you have other choices look around see what else you can do the internet has opened many doors after a friend of mine wanted to hire a van so he looked on the net and soon he had 20 offers of van with working driver there were work and trading chances on the web it has changed the lives of people with ideas and energy even those with little experience and career successful internet and mail order business wealth and kathy started chelly's gulor by making chelly jelly to give away to the, their friends in their kitchen in Norfolk 50 years ago. They progressed to selling at fairs and the response from Chelly Lover Everywhere led them to go online. Today they, made a, they make and sell a big range of unusual jellies and relish. All their jellies are still grown into greenhouses in the back garden. Prince Charles sells his organic food online and there is even a meal order Christmas tree business. Christmas tree land which started out a small roadside stall. Today they sell anything festive, from bubble baubles to bells. So I was right back when I was eight years old. If the rabbits had behaved, I could have been a Christmas tree king. Even without the internet, anyone can start up a new business from home. You can wash windows, take an eye in ironing or walking dogs. You can be an artist or writer. You can be a gardener. You can make and sell dolls houses and neat erotic mid skin cream in her kitchen now the body shop is big empire you can make salad dressing in your garage like paul newman with him it started in, as a hobby now it's a company he gives all the profits to charity so far he has given away more than one 150 million dollars not paid for a hobby granted paul newman didn't have to worry about funding but there are dozens of things you can do from home to make money. It could be more fun and lead to new career you really enjoy. If you do st if you do still have to work for a boss at a job you don't like, as almost everyone does at some point, don't moan about it. Have a positive outlook on life and just get on it with. Work hard and earn your pay. Enjoy the people you come into contact with your through your job. And if you are still unhappy, make it instead your goal to divide your private life from your work life. Have fun in your own time. You will feel happier and you will enjoy your life in your job more. The end of chapter 2. Chapter 3. Be bold. Calculate the risks and take them. Believe in yourself. Chase your dreams and goals. Have no regrets. Be bold. Keep your word. In 2004, I made a TV series, The Rebel Billionaire. The final episode had a twist at the end. I offered the prize winner, Sean Nelson, a check for $1 million. But there was a catch. He could take the check or toss a coin for an even bigger mystery prize. If he lost the toss, he would lose it all. I held out the check. He took it and saw the long line of zeros. Then I took it back and put it all. I held, I held out the check. He took it. He took it and saw the long lines of zero. Then I took it back and saw the long lines of zero. Then I took it back and put it in my hip pocket. I hold, I held out a silver coin. Which one will it be? I said. The coin or the check? Life is full of hard choices. Which one would? he go for Sean looked shaken it was huge gamble all or nothing he asked me what would you do Richard it's up to you I said I could have told you I could have told him I take risks but they are calculated risks I weigh up the odds in everything I do instead I said nothing he had to make up his own mind Sean walked back and forth trying to decide it was tempting to gamble I would make him look cool. Also, the unknown prize might be amazing. At last, he said he couldn't risk losing that much money on the toss of a coin. He owned a small company. He could use the money wisely to help his business grow. It could change his life for the better. It would also help the people who worked for him and believed in him. 
I'll take the check, he said. I was pleased if you had gone for the coin toss, I would have lost all respect for you. I said he made the, cho he made the right choice and didn't gamble on something that he couldn't control. He got the million dollars in the mystery prize. The big prize was to the president of Virgin for three months. Virgin has 200 companies, so Sean would learn a lot. It was a golden chance. I am always looking for that certain something in people like Sean that makes them different from other people. People who work at Virgin are special. They aren't cheap. They think for themselves. They have good ideas and I listen to them. What is the point of hiring bright people if you don't use their talent? One of the things I try to do at Virgin is making people think about themselves and see themselves more positively. I firmly believe that anything is possible. I tell them, believe in yourself, you can do it. I also say, be bold but don't gamble. I get sent thousands of ideas each week. There are people's goals and dreams. There, there are too many for me to look at. My staff read them first and weed them out. I look at the best ones. One plan I was offered ended in disaster. I was young and my urge was to try anything almost killed me. Sadly, it killed the inventor. A man called Richard Ellis sent me a photo of his flying machine. It had a three-wheeled like, uh, three bike beneath two large wings. It was powered by a small outboard engine. There were rotors above the pilot's head. The photo showed a man soaring above the treetops. I was curious and I invited him to show me how it worked. When he came, we went to the local airfield with Juan and some friends. He took his machine to a landing strip. You had to pedal like mad to get speed up. Then the engine would cut in and start the routers. He said, I would be second person to try it, but he didn't want me to fly. You need to get used to it first, he said. It looked like fun. I sat on the machine. He gave me a cable with a rubber switch at the end, which went in mouth. I had to bite on the switch to make the engine cut out. I would stop at the end of the runway before I took off. Oh go, Elise shouted. I put the cable in my mouth and set off down the runway. I paddled like hell. The engine kicked in. I went faster and faster. When it seemed fast enough, I bit into the switch to stop. Nothing happened. I went even faster. I bit harder. Nothing. I reached 30 miles an hour. I could see John looking at me at the end of the runway as I got closer. Suddenly I rose into the air. The flying machine took off with me hanging on. I was flying. I soared over some trees. I rose higher. When I was at 100 feet, I knew I had to stop it somehow. I tugged at the at wires and pulled them out. I burned my hands on the hot engine, but at last the engine cut out and I spun down to the ground. At the very last moment, a small gust out of, of wind flipped the machine over. Flipped the machine over, a wing took the impact. I felt out the grass. I was safe but shocked. A week later, Ellis took off in the flying machine. It crashed to earth. He died on impact. His death was sad, but people with vision to die, vision do die. Mountain climbers fall and test pilots crash. As a child, I knew the war hero, Douglas Batter. He was a friend of my Aunt Clary's. He lost his legs in a flying accident. He learned to walk and also flew again. You can take care and try to avoid the risks, but you can't protect yourself all the time. I'm sure that luck play a very large part. It's easy to give up when things are hard, but I believe we have to keep chasing our dreams and our goals, as these exciting people did. And once we decided to do something, we should never look back, never regret it. Once One decision I didn't regret was a proposal from a young American lawyer. In 1948, he wanted me to invest, invest me in a new airline that would fly across the Atlantic. Even before I read his plan, had wanted to do it. Freddie Lacker, a childhood hero of mine, ran Sky Train, a cut price airline between England and America. He was a big man with bold eyes. 
he was David to the Goliath of the big airlines. He wanted to make air travel cheap enough so that people could afford it. But the airline had collapsed in 1982 with Freddy in my land chattering to Guru Puerto Rico in mind, I read the proposal. It would cost a great deal of money and I told myself, don't be tempted, don't even think about it. But I was tempted. The idea grabbed me and it was exciting. I can make up my mind about people and ideas in 60 seconds. I rely more in gut instinct than thinking reports. I knew within a minute that this was for me. It was a very bold step but worth it. I decided to look into it. I had to work out in my mind that the rest were. There was already a popular airline that sold cheap fares across the Atlantic. It was called People Express. I tried to call them. It seemed everyone must want it to fly as the airlines were busy. I tried all day but couldn't get through. I knew I could run an airline better than that. I spent a weekend thinking it over. By Sunday evening, I had made up my mind. I would be bold. I would just do it. On Monday, I called Biogging, the biggest American company that made plans. I asked how much it would cost to rent a jumbo jet for a year. They were surprised, but they listened to me. By the end of the call, we had worked out a good surprise. I felt I had gone enough research. I met my parents and Virgin Music to discuss it. They said I was crazy. I said we could afford it. We had to be bold. I don't want us to sit to sit on our money like my misers. It's there to be used, I said. They still didn't look happy so I pressed on. I said that Virgin Music was making a lot of money. The money to start an airline was less than a third of year's profits. It was a lot, but not too much. Even if we lost it all, we would survive. It's not too big risk. And it'll be fun. They weren't happy with the word fun to them. Business was serious. It is, but to me, having fun matters more. I want to live life to the full. I want new goals to reach for. I decided to call the airline Virgin Atlantic. I asked Sir Freddie Lacker to lunch to talk about my new project. He was a great help. He had years of experience. Most of all, he knew the problems in starting a new airline. His air gone well until the big airlines undercut him. They had the money to keep going. They could afford to make losses while they drove his new airline out. Freddie ran on shoe string. And he ran out of money and went bust. Over lunch, he told me how an airline worked. We discussed what I should look out for. Freddie said, look out for dirty tricks from British Airways. Base British dirty tricks ruined me. Don't let them ruin you. Complain as loudly as you can. My mistake was that I didn't complain. I don't like to complain. I don't cry over spilled milk. I just get on the things, but I made a mental note. Watch out for dirty tricks. Complain loudly. Freddie also advised, don't make it cheap. No frill service. The big airlines can undercut you like they did to me. Instead, offer a better service than they do at a good price. People want comfort and don't forget the fun. People like to have fun. Good luck. Be ready for a great deal of stress. All of his advice was helpful when I had to talk to officials. Safety was a big concern. Making sure the airliner was well funded was another. I worked out a cash flow survival plan. I hired the right people. I got a good team. I struck to it. I wouldn't take no for an answer. I found other ways around problems. And believe me, there were endless problems. BA did 30. BA did try dirty tricks against me. They tried to destroy us by ruining my name. Sir Freddy said, sue the bastards. And I took British Airways to court for label and won. When Virgin Atlantic launched in 1984, not one person thought it would survive for more than a year. 
the bosses of the big American airline company said, I'd file. Now they're all out of, they're all out if business. I'm still there. I was bold, yes, but not foolish. I took a risky a risk by starting up airline, but the odds were good. They were not all or nothing, like they were with winner of the rebel billionaire. And I had thought through how to manage the risks. Sean Nelson could have won it all or lost it all on the spin of a coin. It took courage to refuse. My next big venture was starting Virgin Trains in 1996. I got the idea when I was in Japan. I was there to look for a site to build a new mega store. When we took the bullet train, I thought it was great. It was like being on a plane. Why can't trains be like this in the UK? I thought. I jotted down some notes to remind me it was fate. The next week, the UK government said they would break up the old train system, British Rail, and let new business compete to run trains. I jumped in and said I was interested. The news hit the papers. Virgin to go into trains. They said it was a bold move. Again, as with the airline, some people said I would fail. It took five years, but we did it. We produced the world's most advanced learning train. It was a proud moment when my wife, Joan, named it Virgin Lady at the time. It went too fast for the UK's old tracks. Once again, we were ahead of everyone. The TV news said we, ha we had made good on our promises. One thing I always try to do is to keep my word. I set my goals and stick to them. Success, uh, them. success is more than luck. You have to believe in yourself and make it happen. That way others also believe in you. Sometimes I get business offers that I turn down. I had the chance to invest in Ryanair, a good no frills, frills airline. I, inter I turned it down. Ryanair is still going strong. I also turned down the chance to invest in Trivial Pursuit and Wind Up Radio. All of them were good ideas. I turned the I turned down the chance to be Loyal's name. Lawyers is the biggest insurance company in the world. They insure against huge losses like hurricanes and earthquakes. Turn them turning them down though was a good choice. I could have lost a fortune. Some you win and some you lose. Be glad when you win. Don't have regrets when you lose. Never look back. You can't change the past. I tried to learn from it. We can't all run big airlines or trains. Many people have more modest goals. But whatever your dream, whatever your dream is, go for it. Always be aware of the risks are too random or too hard to protect. But remember, if you opt for a safe life, you'll never know what it's like to win. End of chapter 3. Chapter 4. Challenge yourself. Aim high, try new things, always try. Challenge yourself. Everyone needs something to aim for. You can call it a challenge or you can call it a goal. It is what makes us human. It was challenges that took us from being cavemen to reaching for the stars. If you challenge yourself, you will grow. Your life will change, your outlook will be positive. It's not always easy to reach your goal, but it's but that's no reason to stop. Never say die. Say yourself I can do it. I'll keep trying until I win. For me, there are two types of challenge. One is to do the best I can at work. The other is to seek an adventure. I try to do the both. I try to stretch myself to the limit. I'm driven. I love the challenge of looking for new things and new ideas. To me, the stretch is fun. My first big challenge came when I was four or five years old and when we went to Devon for two weeks one summer. Dad's sisters and an uncle went with us. When we got there, I ran onto the beach and started at the sea. I couldn't swim and Auntie Joyce bit me ten shillings that I couldn't learn to swim by the end of the holiday. I took the bet, sure I would win. Most days the sea was rough and the waves were high, but I tried for hours. Day after day I splashed along with one foot on the bottom. I grew blue with cold and swallowed a lot of seawater, but still I couldn't swim. Never mind, Ricky, Auntie Josie said. Kindly, there is always next year. 
I had lost the bet. I was sure she would forget about it next year. As we set off home in the car, I gazed out of the window. How I wished I had learned to swim. I hated losing the bet. It was a hot day and in the 1950s the roads were very narrow. We weren't going very fast when I saw a river. We hadn't got home so we were still really on holiday. I knew it was my last chance to win. Stop the car, I shouted. My parents knew about the bet and they obviously would not have done what I said when I was at that age. I think my father knew what I wanted and how much it meant to me. Dad drove off the road and parked. What's up? He asked. Ricky wants to have another go at, at winning that 10 shillings, Mum said. I jumped out of the car and stripped quickly, then ran across a field to the river. When I got to the bank, I felt scared. The river looked deep and fast, running over rocks. There was a muddy part where cows drank from. It was easy to reach the water from there. I turned my head and saw everyone standing, watching me. Mom smiled and waved me on. You can do it, Ricky, she called. I walked through the mud and waded into the water. As soon as I got in the meadow, the current, the current caught at me. I went under and choked. I came up and was swept for fast downstream. I took a deep breath and relaxed. I knew I could do it. I put one foot on a rock and pushed off. Soon I was swimming. I swam in an awkward circle, but I would won the bet. I heard the family cheering on the bank. When I crawled out, I was done in, but very proud. I crawled through mud and stinging needles to reach Auntie Joycey. She held up the ten shillings. Well done, Ricky, she said. I knew you could do it, Mum said, and so had I. And I was not going to give up until I had proved it. One thing I couldn't do very well was read. I always found lessons hard at school because I was mildly dyslexic. I hated to admit defeat, but however hard I struggled, as with many other people, reading and writing were hard for me. For some reasons, this made me want to be a reporter, a job where reading and writing were always needed. When I found that my school had an essay contact, I entered. I don't know who was the most surprised when I won. I was the boy who was often canned for failing tests, but I had won, by, but I had won an essay contest. I was thrilled. When I told to mom, she said, I knew you could win, Ricky. Mom is one of those people who never says can't. She believes anything is possible if you try. For then on, my schoolwork is improved. I learned to focus on hard words and my spelling got better. I think this shows that you can achieve almost anything but you have to make the effort. I didn't stop challenging myself. I went on from winning that essay prize to staring student magazine. I think I wanted to prove that the boy who was canned for not being able to read or write very well could do it and I did it. As I grew older, I faced bigger challenges. I seemed to run on high energy. I wanted adventure. Danger tempted me. I had already set a record for being the first to cross the Atlantic in Berlin with Per. Next, we decided to cross the Pacific Ocean from Japan to USA. It was a far more dangerous venture. Across 8,000 miles of open sea, no one had ever done it before. I knew how risky it was because our rival had just died in an attempt. His balloon had torn and he landed in the freezing sea. It was so stormy he couldn't be rescued in time and he died from cold. Juan didn't want me to go on this trip and I must admit I was nervous. But I had promised to go and we were ready for the attempt. I couldn't withdraw, so I resigned myself to fate. My head said stop, but my heart said go. Whatever the danger, I wouldn't give in, and I think Joan understood. I knew it would be a strange trip. I was a team player who always looked for the best in the people. Per was a quiet loner who always looked for the worst. 
I hoped we ho- we would balance each other out. It was 1990 and just before we left I spent Christmas on a small island near Japan with my family and friends. It was very lovely and peaceful there. I watched men catching fish with timbers. Their lives seemed calm and tranquil. I wondered what they would think of my con- constant rushing about. I only knew the challenges were that drove me onwards. Our plan was to cross the ocean on one of the jet streams that that circled the earth between 20,000 and 4,000 feet up. They travel as faster as a river in full flood. Below that, the winds are slower. Our problem was the height of our giant balloon from the top to the bottom of the capsule below. It was over 300 feet. As we broke through into the jet stream, the top half of the balloon and the bottom would travel at different speeds. Anything could happen. Inside the capsule, we put on our parachutes and clipped ourselves to the life rafts that if anything went wrong, we did not waste valuable time doing that later. Then we fired the burners. As we rose, the top of the balloon hit the bottom of the jet stream. It was like hitting a glass ceiling. We burned more fuel to try to rise, but the winds were so strong, they kept uh, pushing us down. We burned even more fuel and at last broke through. The top of the balloon was caught by the fast current and took off like a rocket. It was flying along a crazy angle at 115 miles an hour. The capsule with us inside it was still going at 25 mph. It felt like uh, a thousand horses were dragging us apart. We feared the balloon would be torn in two and the heavy capsule would hurdle thousands of feet down to the sea. But at the last moment, the capsule sh- uh, shot through the glass ceiling and the balloon right- righted itself. No one has ever done that before, per se. We flew along at great speed, faster than we thought possible. Seven hours later, it was time to lose the first empty fuel tank. It seemed safer to drop down out of the jet stream to do this. We cut off the burners and went down into a slower zone. At once the capsule acted like a brake, but the balloon still hurtled along. We could see the angry grey sea 25,000 feet below us. I wondered if we would end up in it. Per pressed the button to release the empty fuel tank, at once the capsule lurched sideways. The floor tilted and I fell against Purr. To our horror, we found that two full tanks as well as the empty one had fallen off one side. They weighed a ton each. Not only we were loop-sided and off balance, now we didn't have enough fuel to control our height and find the right wind pattern. So we couldn't reach the USA. Three tons lighter. The balloon soared upwards. We hit the jet stream so fast we shot through glass ceiling like a bullet and kept on raising. Pearl let some air cut off the air balloon but still we flew up and up. We had been warned that the glass doom of our capsule would explode at 43,000 feet and our lungs and eyeballs would be socked out of our bodies. At 41,000 feet we entered the unknown. We reached a frightening 42,500 feet. We had no idea what might happen. We were higher not only than any balloon had been, but than than any aircraft had ever flown, except Concorde. At last we stopped rising, the balloon cooled and we started to fall fast. We didn't want to burn extra fuel, but we had to to stop falling. We couldn't come down in the sea because there was no one to rescue us. We would have to last for another 30 hours on almost no fuels. In order to reach land, we had to fly faster than any balloon had ever flown before. That means staying right in the center of the jet stream, a space just 100 yards wide, it seemed impossible. The final straw was when we lost radio contact. We had been going for hours in Per Warren out. He lay down and fell into an instant deep sleep. 
it i was on my own i don't believe in god but that day it felt as if a guardian angel had entered the capsule and was helping us long from the dials i saw that we had started to speed up faster and faster i thought i was dreaming and slapped my face to make sure i was awake we went from 80 miles an hour through to 180 then 200 and then 240 this was unheard of it seemed like a miracle I was so bone weary I felt spaced out when I saw strange flickering lights in the glass dome I thought they were spirits I watched them as if in a dream until I realized that burning lumps of gas were falling around it was minus 7 degrees outside if a fireball hit the glass dome it would explode per I yelled wake up we are on fire per woke up fast He knew at once what to do. Take uh take her up 40,000 feet where there is no oxygen, he said. Then the fire will go out. At just under 43,000 feet, the flames died and we started down again, but we had wasted precious fuel. Then the radio came back on, a voice said, "Wars broken out in the Gulf. The Americans are bombing Baghdad." It seemed strange that while we were alone almost on the edge of space a war had just started on earth our ground crew told us our jet stream had turned it would loop us back to the Japan we had to get into a lower jet stream at once one that would take us to the architect we dropped down to 3000 30000 feet and flew hour after hour at over 200 miles an hour in a loop sided capsule we finally landed in a blizzard on a frozen lake in the far north of canada in a wild area 200 times in the size of britain we were so far off the beaten track to took uh, to it took 8 hours to be rescued by then we both had frost bite next time we'll fly around the world per se i laughed but i knew i couldn't turn down a challenge We made the attempt a couple of years later, but someone bit us to it. Now I am planning space travel as my next big thing with Virgin Galactic. Just before we had left to cross the Pacific, my daughter Holly sent me a fax. She wrote, "I hope you don't land in the water and have a bad landing. I hope you have a good landing in London or dry land." It seemed a perfect metaphor for life. I have been lucky so far. I have nearly. always landed on a dry land i think the writer in mountain climbers james olman summed it up all when he said something like challenge is the core and main spring of all human action if there is an ocean we cross it if there is a disease we cure it if there is a wrong we right it if there is a record we break it and if there is a mountain we climb it i totally agree and believe we should all continue to challenge ourselves the end of chapter 4 Chapter 5 Stand on your own feet Rely on yourself chase your dreams but live in the real world work together If you want milk don't sit on a stool in the middle of the field in the hope that the cow will back up you This old saying could have been one of one of mother's quotes She would have added Go on Rocky don't just sit around cage the cow an old recipe for rabbit pie said first cage the rabbit note that it didn't say first buy the rabbit or sit on your bottom until someone gives it to you lessons like this taught me to to me by my mom from when i was a toddler are what have made me stand on my own two feet I was trained to think for myself and get things done. It is what the British as a nation used to believe in, but there are some kids today who seem to want everything handed to them on a plate. Perhaps if your parents were like mine, where we would be a nation of go-getters as we used to be. When I was 4 years old, mom stopped the car a few miles from our house and told me to find my own way home across the fields. She made it a game. 
one I was happy to play. It was an early challenge. As I grew older, these lessons grew harder. Early one winter morning, mom shook me awake and told me to get dressed. It was dark and cold, but I crawled out of bed. I was given a packed lunch and an apple. I'm sure you will find some water along the way, mom said, as she waved me off on a 50-mile bike ride to the south coast. It was still dark when I set off on my own. I spent the night with a relative and returned home the next day. When I walked into the kitchen at home, I felt very proud. I was sure I would be greeted by cheers. Instead, mom said, well done, Ricky. Was that fun? Now run along. The vicar wants you to chop some logs for him. To some people, this might sound harsh, but the members of my family love and care for each other very much. We are a close-knit unit. My parents wanted us to be strong and to rely on ourselves. Dad was always there for us, but mom was the one who drove us to want to do our best. I learned about business and money from her. She would say things like, the winner talks all in the and chess your dreams. Mom knew that losing wasn't fair, but it is life. It is a good idea to teach children that they can win all the time. In the real world, people struggle. When I was born, dad was just starting out in law and money was tight. Mom didn't mourn. She had two aims. One was to find useful tasks for me and my sisters. Being idle was frowned on. The other was to find ways to make money. At home, we talk business at dinner. I know some parents keep their work away from the kids. They won't share their problems, but I believe that their problem, their children never really learn the value of money. Sometimes when they get into the real world, they can't choke, cope. We knew that the real world was about. My sister Lindy and I helped mom with her projects. It was fun. It made for a great sense of teamwork within our family. I have tried to bring Holly and Sam up in the same way, although I have been lucky to have more money than my parents had. I still think my mom's rules were good and I believe Holly and Sam have learned the value of money. Mom made little wooden tissue boxes and waste paper bins. Her workshop was the garden shed and it was our job to help her. We painted them and stacked them up. Harrods ordered them and sales boomed. She also took in French and German students as paying guests. Hard work and fun were family traits. Mom's sister, Aunt Clary, was keen on black Welsh sheep. She got the idea of starting a company to sell mugs with black sheep on them. Ladies in the village needed woolly, woolies with sheep designs. The company did very well and it is still going strong. Years later, when I was running Virgin Records, Aunt Clary phoned me to say that one of her sheep had started singing. I didn't laugh. Her ideas were always clever. Instead, I followed the sheep around with a tape recorder. Baba Black Sheep became a height hit. It reached number four in the charts. I went from small cottage industry to setting up Virgin Worldwide. The risks became bigger. I learned to be bold in my dealings and ideas. Although I listen with care to everyone, I still rely on myself in, in my goals. I lost faith in myself only once. By 1986, Virgin was one of the British's largest private companies with 4,000 members of staff. Sales had increased by 60% from the years year before. I was told I should go public, sell shares in my business. Two of my partners were not keen because they knew me well. They said I would hate losing control. But the banker said it was a good idea. It would give me more capital to work with. Other big private companies like Body, Sh Body Shop and Sock Shop had gone public. They were doing well. Pushed hard why the bankers, I made up my mind and launched Virgin on the stock exchange. Around 70,000 people applied for shares by post. Those who had left a too late lined up in the city to buy shares in person. I will never forget walking up the line, long line of people to thank them for their faith in us. I was very moved with, when they said things like, we are not going 
holiday this year. We are putting our savings and virgins and we are banking on you, Richard. It wasn't long though before I came to hate the ways of the city. There weren't for, they weren't for me. Instead of a casual meeting with my business partners on my house boat to discuss what what bands to sign, I had to ask a board of directors. Many of them had no idea at all what the music business was all about. They didn't see how a hit record could make millions overnight. Instead of being able to sign someone who was hot, before our rivals did, I had to wait for I had to wait four weeks for a board meeting. By then it was too late. Or they'd say things like sign the Rolling Stones. My wife doesn't like them. Janet Jackson. Who's she? I have always made fast decisions enacted in on my instinct instinct. Then I was stifled most of all. I no longer felt that I was standing on my own feet. We doubled our profits, but virgin shares started to slip. And for the first time in my life I was depressed. Then there was a huge stock market crash. Shares dropped fast. It wasn't my fault, but I felt that it was letting down all the people who had bought virgin shares. Ma many f were friends and family as well as our staff. But many were like the couple who had given me their f life savings. I made up my mind. I would buy all the shares back at the price everyone had paid for them. I didn't have to pay that much, but I didn't want to let people down. I personally raised the 182 million pounds needed, but it was worth in it to keep my good name and my freedom. The day that Virgin became a private company again was like landing safely after a record attempt in powerboat or a battle. I felt nothing but relief. Once again, I was the captain of my ship and the master of my fate. I believe in myself, I believe in the hands that work, in the brains that think, and in the hearts that love. The end of chapter 5 Chapter 6 Live the moment, love life, and live it to the full. Enjoy the moment, reflect on your life, make every second count, don't have regrets. It was 1997, I was in, a, in around the world world hot air balloon race before i left i wrote a long letter to my children in case i didn't return i started the letter by saying dear holly and sam life can seem rather unreal at times alive and well and loving one day no longer there the next as you both know i always had the urge to live life to its full i wrote the letter just in case the worst happened we had taken off at dawn from Mar Marrakech in Morocco 12 hours later. It seemed as if we were about to crash in flames into the Atlas Mountains. The, this saying, a dying man relieves in his life in his final seconds. For me, this was not true. Although I thought was that if I escaped with my, my life, I would never do this again. We fought hard all night to keep the ballon up. By dawn we were over the desert, where we could come down safely. As we drifted to earth, I sat up on the glass roof of the capsule, watching the beauty of the golden dawns as it broke over the desert. This was a day I never thought I'd see, and in, in the rising sun and growing warmth of the day seemed very precious. It made me aware that hard-won things are more valuable than, than those that come to, uh, too easily. It reminded me to always enjoy the moment. I love balloons to, to such an extent that I, I have one of my own. It is a small balloon with a wicker basket like the one in around the world in 80 days. I often take family and friends up in it. It is one of the pe most peaceful places I know. It makes me feel at one the, with nature. You glide silently along. Away from the rest of the world, no one can phone you, no one can stop you, you are free. You look down on towns and fields and people who don't know you are there. You can fly nest to a wild swan and hear the beat of its wings. You can look into the eyes of an eagle. Balloons have taught me to reflect more on earth. My life is fast and hectic, each moment full. It can be too busy. We all need our own space and it's good to pause and do nothing. 
it gives us time to think it recharges our bodies as well as our minds i often think of the fisherman i watched that christmas in japan it is in our nature to strive so i wondered what they looked for in life they seemed content fishing and feeding their families they didn't seem driven to set up fish canning empires as far as i knew they didn't want to cross the pacific in a balloon or climb mount everest they took each day as it came they lived in the moment and perhaps this is what gave them peace of mind my grandmother lived life to the full at the age of 89 she became the oldest person in britain to pass the advanced latin american ballroom dancing exam she was 90 when she became the oldest person to hit a hole in one at golf she never stopped learning in her mid 90s she read stephen hawking's book a brief history of time which may make her one of the few people to, to have read it all the way through shortly before her death at the age of 99 she went on to cruise around the around the behind in jamaica wearing only her swimming costume her attitude was that you have only got one go in life so you should take you should make the most of it my parents are getting on and are into their 80s now like granny dead they still hop on and off plans and travel around the world they have been there at the start and end of all my adventures cheering cheering me on they even went looking for me when power and i were lost in the wilds of the frozen north after our balloon came down in the blizzard in canada their example reminds me to enjoy life in 1999 we bought a game reserve in south africa and built a lovely house here we spend time together as a family in fact i am so aware of how precious time with them is i ration myself to only 15 minutes of business a day when we were together i don't use modern gadgets like email or mobile phones but in africa i did learn to use a satellite phone to keep in touch with the office many bosses who spend all day in the office are baffled they ask how can you do it all in just 15 minutes i say it's easy make every second count that is true in both my business and in personal life i'm able to say that now because i am older and perhaps wiser it wasn't always the case my first wife kristen got very irate because i was always on the phone she said i spend my life working and couldn't draw the line between work and home she was right part of the part of the trouble was that i worked from home I couldn't resist picking up the phone when it rang which did non-stop. I wished I could just let it ring but I never knew when it might lead to a nice deal. Even today, even when I'm relaxing, I never stop thinking. Brain is working all the time when I'm awake and churning out ideas. Because Virgin is a worldwide company, I find I need to be awake much of the time. One of the things I'm very good at it uh, is cat cat napping. Catching an hour or two of sleep at a time. Of all the skills I have learned, that one is vital for me. On a bus between Hong Kong and China, for example, when nothing much is going on, I will sleep. I wake refreshed and ready to go for long hours. It is also a very good way of switching off. Winston Churchill and Margaret Thatcher were masters of the catnap, and I use their example in my own life. The Spanish painter Salvador Dali had a unique way to savor the moment. When he was bored with why with life, he would walk in his cliff-top garden. He would pick a perfect piece warm from the sun. and hold it in his hand to admire its golden skin he would sniff it the warm perfume would fill his senses then he would take a single bite his mouth would fill with luscious juice he would savor it slowly then he would spit out the mouthful and threw the pitch into the sea below he said it was a perfect moment and he gained more from than the from eating a basket of peach peaches In a way regrets are like wanting the peach you have thrown away it's gone but you are filled with remorse you wish you hadn't thrown it away you want it back i believe the one thing that helps is 
to have no regrets. Regrets weigh you down. They hold you back in the past when you should move on. It is hard to lose out in a business deal, but harder still to suffer from guilt. We all do things we wish we hadn't. Sometimes they seem like big mistakes, but later when they seem like big mistakes, but later when you look back, they turn out to be small. Regret which leads to a sense of guilt can give you sleepless nights, but I believe the past is the past. You can't change it. So even if sometimes you get the things wrong, regrets are wasted and you should move on. A case of this is when Kristen and I went on a holiday to Mexico. She chose a place where they were, there were no phones. No one could get in, in touch with me. A couple of days before we were due to leave, I tried to hire a boat to go to a deep sea fishing. I asked the fisherman if he would take us out the next day. He refused, saying it looked like there might be a storm. I thought he was holding out for, for, for more money. I was eager to go in I say and said I would pay him double. A couple more tourists from the bar said they'd go too. And they also paid double. We were having exciting day of sport. When I noticed that it was growing dark, the wind rose and it grew cold, it started to rain. They started they started the engine to head home but the rudder jumped so the boat couldn't steer and went round in circles. The storm grew stronger and the sea was being pounded hard. I was sure she was about to break up and sink. After an hour, the worst of the storm seemed to have passed. There was calm and strange light. In fact, we were in the eye of the storm. In the distance, I could see a solid black line coming closer across the waves. It was the far wall of the storm and looked alarming. I thought we would all die when it hit us. Kristen was a strong swimmer and she said we should swim for the shore, which was two miles away, and tried to beat the storm. Everyone said we were mad, but the fishermen gave us a plank of wood to hold on to and we jumped into the sea. I went from being scared of drowning to the terror of being eaten by sharks. We were swept far down the coast. Two hours later, half frozen, we dragged our way up through the surf onto the beach. Somehow stumble, we stumbled through mongrove swamps back to the village of for help. We found a big boat to go and rescue the fishing boat, but we ran into an even bigger storm and were tossed back to shore. When the storm cleared, they searched for two days but found nothing. I could have tried to live with guilt. Instead, although, there, although it was a tragic, I realized that I had to apply logic to it. I told myself that the fishermen took the money against their better judgment, but they didn't have to. It was the state of the boat that was the problem, and that wasn't my fault. If a ferry goes down with loss of life, it's not the passengers who are at fault, but the captain or the owners. The story of the lost boat came out when my book was published some years later. The Daily Mirror sent a reporter to Mexico to find out what had happened. To my relief, they found the boat and the crew alive and well. The tide and winds had taken them many miles down the coast. It took time to fix their boat and there was no radio and no phones to keep in touch. After we had left for home, they sailed safely into a harbor. I didn't know any of this. I could have spent years living with needle, needle, needless remorse if I had allowed myself to. Always living in the future can slow us down as much as always looking behind. Many people are always looking ahead and they never seem content. They look for quick fixes like winning the lottery. I knew that goals are important. Money is important, but the bottom line is money is just a means to an end, not an end in itself. And what is going on now is just as important as what you are planning for the future. So even though my diary is full of months ahead, I have learned to live for the moment. The end of chapter 6. Chapter 7. Value family and friends. Put the family and the team first. Be loyal. Face problems head on. Money is for making things happen. Pick the right people and reward talent. 
One evening, just up the coast from Kingston on the island of Jamaica, I sat on the beach outside a bar listening to Bob Marley and drinking beer. In the sea, a flock of pelicans were diving after fish. They took turns, one after another, diving into shoals. They seemed to be working as a team so each bird would get a share. Our family was like that, a close-knit team. Virgin is like a big family. Today there are some 40,000 members of staff, but each one of these team members are counts. This idea of teamwork came from my childhood. Mom always tried to find something for us to do. If we tried to escape, she told us we were selfish. One Sunday at church, instead of sitting next to a boy who was saying who was staying with us, I slid into the next seat to my best friend Nick. Mom was hoping Mom was hoping mad a guest was a guest, she said, and guests must be put first. She told Dad to beat me. He didn't. Behind the closed door of his study, he clapped his hands to make the right noise and I hold loud enough for mom to hear. My dad was often out at work and it was mom who was in control of the children but they were both a big influence and I continue to get on well with both of them today. You can be best friends with someone and still not agree with them. And if you are close, you can get through and through it and remain friends. Nick came, Nick came to work on student magazine with me. He was good at handling the money side of the things. He moved our cash out of the old basket tin where we kept it into a proper bank account. He also helped us find a big house so we could move out of our cramped basement office. I thought things were doing well, so I was shocked. When I sat down at my desk one day to find a moment to the staff, the memo said they should sack me as a publisher and run students among themselves. Nick had left it there by mistake. I felt betrayed but knew, but knew I had to return the crisis around getting rid of Nick. I asked him to step outside and said, some of the others have come to me and said they don't like what you were planning. I acted like I knew all about it. Nick was in shock that he had been caught out. I said we can remain friends but I think you should go. Nick looked sheepish. I'm sorry Ricky he said. I thought it was for the best. I He left and we did remain friends. It was the first fight I had ever had with anyone. I was very upset that the fight was with my best friend, but my facing it, but my face, but by facing it head on, I stopped it from getting worse. The lesson I learned was that it, it's best to bring things out into the open. A, dis, a dispute with a friend or a colleague can be sorted in a friendly way. Student continued to grow. We expanded into selling and in selling mail orders records. I couldn't do it on my own and offered Nick the chance to come back and for 40% per, 40 of the new mail order business if he would return. He bore me to he bore me no crouch and came back into the fold. Many was always tight in those early years. Nick held handled the problem by cutting costs and being nice to debt collectors when who then caused us less often. He said, it's fine to pay bills late as long as you pay them in the end. In the end, the mail order business boomed, but the student was taking up too much time and another problem was cash flow of cash through the business might dry up. I tried to sell the magazine to IPC, one of the biggest print media groups in the UK at that time. They were eager to have me stay as, an, as a debtor and ask for my plans. As always, I had plenty of ideas and launched into them. I think the IPC board was stunned when they heard my lavish dreams for the future. I started, I started talking about a cheap student bank, nightclubs and hotels for students. I said we should run a cheap train service and I mentioned a cheap airline. It was clear that they thought I was madman. 
we'll let you know, they said. As they showed me the door, don't call us, we'll call you. That was the end of my big plans for student. Instead, we opened our first record shop. I often wonder what would have happened if IPC has listened to me. Would they instead of Virgin have airlines and trains now? Our next step was to open a studio to make records. I wanted it to be a place where people could come and hang out and have fun. In the early 1970s, recording studios were like an office. They were hostile places for bands to work in. Having to play rock and roll at 9 o'clock in the morning was not fun. Also, every band had to supply everything that they needed from drums to amps. I decided to look for a large country house where we could all be one big happy family. I was excited when I saw an advert of for a castle for a sale of for only 2000 pounds. It was a bargain. I loved the idea of owning a castle. I dreamed of bands like the Beatles and had been in the 1960s in the Rolling Stones flocking there to record. Full of high hopes and big plans, I drove to Walls to inspect it. Sadly, the castle was stuck in the middle of a new housing estate. My dreams faded. On the way back to London, I saw another advert for an old manor house near Oxford. It wasn't castle, but it perhaps it would, it would do. I drove down narrow line off the beaten track, a long drive wound off through trees. The house was at the end. As soon as I saw the lovely rambling old place, I fell in love with it. Glowing in the evening sun, it stood in its own private park. There were tons of room. The stones and the beetles could have a wing each. It was perfect. Excited, I called the real, the estate agent. It's 35,000 pounds, he said. Will come down a little, I asked. For a quick sale, you can have it for 30,000 pounds. It's a bargain. Perhaps it was a bargain. If you had that kind of money, I was thinking more in terms of 5,000 pounds. The asking price was so far beyond my reach, it didn't seem worthwhile trying to raise it. But I had to try and achieve my dream. For, for the first time in my life, I put on a smart suit and polished my old school shoes i hoped to impress my bank into giving me a loan later they told me when they saw me in a suit and polished shoes they knew i was in trouble i showed them the books for the mail order business and shop to my shock they offered me twenty thousand pounds that was a lot of money in 1971. no one had ever lent me that much before it gave me a real buzz and sense of pride I felt I had come a long way since the days I, when I stood in the payphone in the school trying to sell adverts and student, but 20,000 pounds still wasn't enough. I hoped my family would help. They had always been there for me and I understood then, uh, then I, as I still do know how vital that is when you are starting out. My parents had set up small trust funds for my sisters and me. We would have uh, £2,500 each when we were 30. I went to ask if I could have mine early. They agreed at once. Then Dad said, you are still £7,500 short. Where will you get it from? I don't know, I said. Dad said, go to lunch with Auntie Joycey. I'll tell her you are coming. So I went to lunch with my dear Aunt Josie. She was the aunt who had bet me 10 shillings. I wouldn't learn to swim. Dad had called her as he promised. She knew all, all about my dreams for the manor. She offered to lend me the money to be, pa to be paid back with interest when I could afford it. I started to babble my thanks. She stopped me. Look, Recky. I wouldn't lend you the money if I didn't want to. What's money for anyway? It's to make things happen. Besides, she said with a smile, I know how you stick at things. You won that ten shillings fair and square. I could still hear her words in my head when I went to pick up the huge key to the manor. Money was for making things happen. I believed, I believed it then and I believe it now. I also knew that... Without my family, I would have 
I would not have been holding that big old iron key in my hand. What I didn't know was that Aunt Josie didn't have to 7500 to spare. She had such faith in me, she borrowed by taking out a mortgage on her own house. 30 years, 13 years after buying the manor, we launched our airline. When we flew to New York, the plan was packed with my family and friends, all the people who counted in my life. As I, as I looked at the proud and happy faces of my family, I knew they had helped me what I was. I have learned always to respect talent, even if someone is hired to do things, to do one thing. If they have good ideas or can handle something else, just let them do it. This, this, when I walk around asking people's advice in street on a plan or on a train, it's true that what they say. Hat the man in the in the street often has our common sense than many big bosses. Ken Berry is a good example. Ken started in one of our our record shops as a clerk. His his first job was to check the takings, but before long he was doing any other things. Whenever I wanted to know something, it didn't matter what. I would call Ken. He seemed to know everything about everything. Today people turn to Google or Yahoo. We just asked Ken. Two of the uh, two of the best things about him were that he could get on with people that he didn't have any go. We found he was good at dealing with anyone for for the top stars to their lawyers. Soon we had him working on the contracts. It was obvious that his talents were wasted as a clerk and had joined our small team in running Virgin. He became chief executive officer of Virgin Music and a law and later on of EMI. As usual, I didn't always follow Ken's advice. Once we had grown too fast and we were running out of cash, I called a crisis meeting. At the time, our top seller was Mike Old's, Old Phil's Tobler Bills. Its massive sales funded everything, but our contract with Mike had expired and was pushing for more money to renew it. I was very frank with him. I told him the whole of Virgin Music was making less money than he was on his own. Why? he asked. I explained. I explained that we had many bands that didn't make any money at all, so I finance at all he said. I nodded yes pretty much. I thought he would be pleased to learn how many bands he was helping to support. But he looked peeved. I'm not giving my money away for, all, for you to blow it on a load of rubbish, he said. You can afford to pay me more. At the crisis meeting, I said all our eggs were in the basket. We needed to sign more bands and singers. We needed more hits in order to spread the risk and increase the size of the company. Ken Barry had been doing his sums. It's clear to me that we need to get rid of all our bands, apart from Mike Oldfield's, he said. I knew we could jog along and make money with Mike Oldfield's, but I was worried we, we would stay the same small company, and if his record stopped selling, we would sink almost without a race. I told Ken that we needed to find a new big band fast. To save money, we cut back to the bone, we sold our cars, we closed the swimming pool at the manor, we didn't pay ourselves. Those were easy savings, that hard ones, the hard ones were dropping some artists and losing stuff. But we had to cut right back to survive. We came through it at last when we signed to the Six Pistols, they were the start, they were the start of punk, which was the new big thing. On a funny note, when we dropped Dave Batford, who wrote great music, he wrote me a very nice letter, saying he understood. It was pages long, and all were very friendly and polite. He also wrote to Mick Old Oldfield, calling me all the vile names under the sun. It was a pity for him that then he put the letters in the wrong envelopes. People have asked me how can, how I can take so much time. Uh, off to go on adventures around the world. My answer is that when you pick up the right people, you can
can leave them to do it. You know the things like will run smoothly if you're not there. In 1987, it, I was in the middle of a boardroom battle to buy e -I -E -M -I. When I had to dash off, I had agreed to fly a balloon across the Atlantic with Purr. And the weather was right. If we delayed, we could miss the moment. I went knowing that I had the right people to talk the deal through, however, with the very real risk that I might die. The talks were put on an ice until I returned. Uh, if I returned. The hurricane in October of that year blew away all our dreams of owning EMI. The stock market crashed and our shares dropped in value. The banks didn't have faith in things would go up again and wouldn't lend us the money. In the end, I forgot about our takeover bid, strangely. During the dirty tricks affairs with British Airways, when I was struggling to keep the airline afloat, had to sell Virgin Music to EMI for a half ballon pounds, it was one of the saddest days of my life. But in business, you have to make some very hard choices. If the airline had gone under, hundreds of people would have lost their jobs. The half of a billion made us safe for a very long time and give me the cash to start a new business. And Virgin Music was also safe. The team all survived, which was the main thing. If anyone asked me what I believe in above all else, I would say my family. I would firmly believe in the family. I know that sometimes they split up and I have been through some of that myself and I know that some people don't have any more but close friends can be like family. We all need a strong support network. Even though I was taught to stand on my own feet without my loyal family and friends I would be lost. The end of chapter 7. Chapter 8 Have Respect Be polite and respectful. Do the right thing. Keep your good name. Be fair in all your dealings. In the early days of Virgin Music, I talked to some Japanese businessmen. They were very polite to a young man in sweater and jeans who had no money. They taught me how important it was to always keep eyes and ears open and to be polite. They say that you never know what might hear or see you. People talk. Gossip has a habit of getting back to those you gossip about. I have come cr across this myself. One time I had to go to a meeting. I was late. I grabbed some papers and jumped into a taxi. On the way, the driver got very chatty. He said, oh, I know you. You are that, you are that Dick Bronson. You've got a record label. Yes, that's right, I said. Well, I ain't. It my lucky day. Fancy having Mr. Bronson's in my cab. I hoped he might shut up so I could read my papers for the meeting. But he went on. He told me he might be a cabbie by day. But he was also a drummer in a band. He asked if I'd like to hear his demo type. My heart sank. People were always playing taps to me in the hopes they would be discovered. But I didn't want to be rude. That would be lovely, I said. No, you look tired. Tell you what, my mom lives around the corner. She'd love to meet you. Let's drop in and have a cup, a quick cup of tea. No, I'm late, I st started to say. I insist, guy, a cup of tea is what you need. Thank you, I said weakly. Just as we reached the house, the driver put on his tap. I heard the words over the speakers. I can feel it coming in the air tonight. He jumped out of the front seat and held the door open for me. The cab driver was Phil Collins, laughing like mad. When I met the rebel billionaire, I copied the idea from Phil. I made myself look like an old cabbie and drove the young contestants to the manor house where we, where we would be filming. I had my ears peeled and listened to what they said in the back. I also noted how they treated an old man who couldn't left heavy cases. I learned a lot about them for that. Much to their dismay, respect is about how to treat everyone, not just those you want to impress. The Japanese can't wait 2,200 years for a long time goal for their company. They don't like for the quick buck. They want slow, solid growth. 
One time I was looking for a partner to take a stack in Virgin Music. We talked to many Americans. They wanted to invest, but they also wanted to be hands-on, which means closely involved in the running of the company. We had our own way of working, so we want a silent partner. We knew a partner that was too hands-on could cause conflict. I remembered the businessman from Japan who had treated me so kindly a few years later before. So we turned to take the East. I asked the Japanese businessman who came to see me how he was he saw working together. Mr. Branson, he asked gently, would you prefer an American wife or a Japanese wife? American wives are difficult, lots of diverse in L money. Japanese wives are very good and quiet. Good and quiet didn't mean weak. It sounded perfect and we went with this with his company. One of the best lessons I have ever learned was when I did something illegal. I got caught, uh, caught and paid for it. At the time, I thought I was being a bit of a long-haired hippie pirate. E it even seemed a game. I was being bold, but I was also being foolish. Some risks just aren't worth it. During the 1970s, we were all a bit happy and thought it was fun to break the law. The mood was very much us in them. Pirate radio stations were blasting the airwaves from offshore. People were doing drugs by the wagon load. My scam seemed a neat little trick. It started by chance in the spring of 1971. Virgin was known for selling cool cut price records and we had a huge large order from Belgium. If you exported records to Belgium, you didn't have to pay tax on them. So I bought these tax-free records direct from the, the record companies and hired a van to take them across the channel on the ferry. My plan was to land in France and drive on the Belgium. I didn't know that in France you had to pay tax. A Dover the customs people stamped my papers with the number of records I had. When I arrived in France, I asked for, for proof that I wasn't going to sell the records in France. I showed my order from Belgium and said I was just passing through France but it did no good. The French said I had bonded stock and had to pay tax. We agreed but since I didn't want to pay the tax, I had to return by ferry to Dover with all records still in the van. I was angry that I had wasted my time and lost a good order. But on the track, on the drive back to London, it dawned on me that I now had a van load of tax-free records. I even had a custom stamp to prove it. I thought I could s still sell them by mail order in the Virgin shops and make about 5,000 pounds extra profit. It was against the law, but I just thought I was bending the rules a bit. After all, I had started out to be trying to do the right thing. At the time, Virgin owned the bank for 15,000 euros. It seemed as if luck or fate was helping us out. I had always got away with breaking rules and thought this was no different. I would have got away with it if I hadn't been greedy. Instead of just selling the own one van load, I made a total of four trips to France, pretending each time that records were for export and turned right around again. The last time I didn't even bother getting on the ferry. After I got my stamp from the customs, I just drove in a circle in the port at Dover. In one gate and out the other and headed home. I'm sure that if I hadn't been stopped, I might have carried on. It was so easy, only it wasn't easy as I thought. I was being washed. I got a tip off that we were about to be raided. We, we had one night to get rid of all the tax-free stock. We cleared out our warehouse, but we thought that customs wouldn't, be, wouldn't bother our shops. When the customs men burst into the warehouse, I heard a green grin while I watched them search for the illegal records. I didn't know that they were also raiding the shops at the same time. It was a huge shock when I was thrown into prison. I couldn't believe it. I thought that only criminals were arrested and then it slowly dawned on me that I wasn't a happy pirate. That wasn't a game and I was criminal. My headmaster's words came back to me when I left school, aged 16. He said, Branson, I predict that you will either go to prison or become a millionaire. I wasn't a millionaire, but I was in a prison. My parents had always drummed into me that all we had in life was our good name. 
you could be rich but if you didn't trust but if people didn't trust you it counted for nothing i lay on a bare plastic mattress with just an old blanket and vowed that i would never do anything like this again i would spend the rest of my life doing the right thing in the morning mom came to the court to support me i had no money for lawyer and applied for legal aid the judge told me if i asked for legal aid i wouldn't get the bell he said bell he said bell at a whopping 30000 euros i didn't have that kind of money mom put up her home as a bail money instead her trust in me was almost more than i could bear she looked at me across the court and we both started to cry i will always remember her words on the train back to london i know you have learned a lesson ricky don't cry over spilled milk we have got to get on and deal with this head on instead of going to court the customs service agreed to settle the case they they paid me they made me pay a final equal to three times my illegal profit it came to a massive 45000 euros they said i could pay it back at the rate of 115000 euros a year i wasn't angry i wasn't angry i had shown the law no respect and deserved to pay nothing doing not doing anything illegal has been one of my watchwords then my way of restoring my own respect was to pay back every penny without money in fact i gained my goal became to make a lot of money but to do it legally we worked like crazy opening new version record shops and thinking of good ideas to expand even since then when i am asked how far i am prepared to go in achieving my aims my answer is the same i make it a priority not to break the law and i check all the time that i'm not your repetition is everything if you're starting in business and ask me if i have a lesson for you i'd say be fair in all your dealings don't cheat but aim to win this rule should extend to your private life my motto is never do anything if it means you can't sleep at night it's a good rule to follow the end of chapter 8 chapter 9 Do some good, change the world even if in a small way, make a difference and help others. Do no harm, always think what you can do to help. I was brought up to think we could all change the world. I believed that it was our duty to help others and to do good when we could. I'm sure my headmaster was stunned when I wrote a long report about how he could run the school better. I ended grandly with the words I would be very interested in your views on this and my money saved could be put forward towards my next plan. He didn't laugh or even came uh, can me for my check. He handed back my report and said dryly, "Very good, Branson. Put it in the school magazine." Instead, I left school and started my own magazine. I wanted to use it as a platform to change things. When my sister Lindy and I were trying to sell copies of Student in the Street, a tramp asked me for money. I didn't have a penny, but I was so fired up to do good. I tore off my clothes and gave them to him. I had to spend the rest of the day wrapped in the in a blanket, but I felt quite noble. One of the ways we tried to help people was by starting Student's Advice Center. They could ask about anything from flats to grants but mostly they asked for advice about sex. At the time there was nowhere else to go for the kind of advice we offered. The center did so well that 35 years later it is still going strong. I spent the next few years building up Virgin. Making money was nice but it wasn't my main aim in life. I enjoyed hard work. The man who started IKEA divides his day into 10 minute units and don't waste even a minute. You don't have to fill your name rushing about in order to use your time wisely though. Bill Gates, the world's top charity donor, said his staff could spend 2 hours gazing into space as long as their minds were working. And Albert Einstein came up with the theory of relativity in his head without paper or pen. He only wrote it down later. To be honest, I work out all my best ideas in my head too. And because I don't use my hands for my work, perhaps this is why I enjoy taking time off for physical tasks like crossing the Atlantic in a boat. It is said that money is the root of all evil. It 
doesn't have to be. Money can be used for good. The biggest charities in the world were started by rich men and women, but some were begun with next to nothing. Harvard, the wealthiest college in America, it is a charitable trust. It started with a few books in just 350 euros. IKEA started in a garden shed. Its parent company is a charitable trust. The man who dreamed of the Big Mac started life selling paper cups. He was someone else who didn't believe in wasting time. If you have time to plan, you have to die, tie to clean, he always told his staff. Perhaps he was in a hurry because he didn't get the idea for McDonald's until he was age 52. His company now gives 50 million a year to charity. So money can be a force for good, but you don't need to be rich to do good. Children used to collect a silver paper of and empty cola tins to raise money for good causes. Today, they go on charity runs or donate to live aid. There are many ways of helping others. One very simple way is to do no harm, and that costs nothing at all. When I turned 40, I was at all time low. We were battling with British Airways for space in the skies. We had been voted best business classes, airline of the year, but it was a constant fight to find, find enough money to keep it going. It was only Virgin Music's string of hot records that was keeping us afloat. Semin, who run music, Virgin Music, seemed to be losing internet interest in it mostly because he thought the airline could would bankrupt us. I sat down and looked back at my life. I asked myself if I should do something new, if I should have a couple complete change. I had never been a big reader, but I liked the idea of having more time to read. I said to Juan, I think I might go to college and, and do a degree in history. You just want to chase pretty girls, was her blunt reply. Was she right? Yeah. Was I racing midlife crisis? Perhaps so. Instead of thinking what I could do for myself, I wondered if I could do more for others. I thought I might look to uh, might look into politics. I could use my business skills to do some good on major issues, such as fighting cigarette companies. I could fund a cure for cancer, look into healthcare or help homeless people. There were any things I could do that would make me feel useful. I have, I have gone on to follow this path in the rest of my life. I believe we should assess our lives from time to time. Have we reached our goals? Are there things we can weed out that we don't need? I'm not talking about throwing away old shoes or broken chairs. I mean we need to lose our bad habits or lazy ways that hold us back and clutter our minds. My cousin Sir Peter Scott ran a famous wetland, wetlands and bird reserve. When I told him I wanted a lack at my home in Oxford to attract wild birds, he came and gave me advice. I dug it out and built several islands for birds to nest on. Swans, ducks, geese and herons flew in, of, in from all over the place. It's very peaceful spot, somewhere I can think things through. Normally, I like to be in a crowd of people or with family, but sometimes you need space. I like to walk around the lake on my own, just thinking. When I was fighting to survive with the airline, it was one of the few times when I felt totally lost. As I walked around the lake, I had some big decisions to make. When I had told the bank that Virgin Music was worth at least half a billion pounds, they had wanted me to sell to cover their loans to their airline. I had two choices, to close the airline or sell the record company. The problem was that I thought I could keep both. I just needed the bank to keep its nerve. It seemed too safe, but banks don't like risk and they said that if I didn't sell it, they would withdraw my loans. I wasn't sure what to do. I loved Virgin Music and knew that as a company it would continue to grow. We had just signed the Rolling Stones as well as and I, I felt as if I would be letting them and all our other musicians down. I wasn't sure what to do on the rainy day as I walked around the lake. 
In the middle of this worrying time, in August 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait. I heard on I heard on the news that one lakh and fifty thousand refugees had crossed into Jordan. I was a friend with King Rusian and Queen Noor of Jordan. The queen was a beautiful woman, a highly trained Arab American architect who had met her husband when she was working from Jordan Airlines. We had a lot of things in common. She had seen me on TV during my balloon flight around the world and phoned to ask if I would teach the royal family to fly in a balloon. I had shipped a balloon to Jordan and met the royal family. They were all as lovely as she was and the children were polite and friendly. I had a great time flying over the capital, looking down on ancient red tiled roofs. When the people below realized that their king and queen were floating along in a weaker basket above their heads, they ran along, looking up and cheering. It was a difficult time for the king. There had been many attempts on his life and armed bodyguards were always around him, except they didn't know how to protect when he was up in the sky without them. But for King Hussein, it was a welcome moment of complete freedom. When Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, I watched thousands of refugees flooding over the border on the television. I phoned King Hussein and the Queen Noor and asked if I could help. I wanted to make a difference. The Queen said she would see what needed to be done and would get back to me. Later that day she phoned to ask if I could get them some blankets. The desert was very hot during the day and very cold at night. She said blankets could be rigged up to give shade during the day and at night people could roll up in them to keep warm. A few very young children have already died, Queen Noor said. How many blankets do you need? I said, she said, I asked, she said they needed one lakh blankets. We have got only two or three days before hundreds start to die. It's urgent, Richard. Virgin Airlines start, staff got to work. Phoning around in two days, one of our jumbo jets was on its way to Jordan with 40,000 blankets, tons of rice and medical supplies. We returned with British people who had been st stranded in Jordan. As soon as I returned to Britain, I was told that, that the head of British Airways was hopping mad. He said that this should have been asked. It was pointed out to be him that I had offered and he hadn't. In fact, he, he had apparently refused to let BA help in an international crisis, even when approached by Christian aid. So at once he found a load of blankets and rushed them to Jordan. I was pleased that our example had partly pushed him into helping. When I heard that our supplies had reached all the refugees, I flew to Jordan and again stayed with the king and queen in the royal palace. I argued with the minister who I knew had blocked things from moving and got him to send the supplies to the refugees camp. I also had long talks with King Hussein and about Saddam. The king wanted Jordan to remain neutral in the conflict that by then, by then seemed likely. His country was in a very weak position and he also saw both sides of the picture. He hoped things could be ported, sorted out through talks, but he was worried that the West might go to war to protect the old field, oil fields in Kuwait. He knew there was very little time. A few days later, I was watching the news in London when I saw Saddam on TV. He had taken British hostages and was using them as human shells. I thought about what I could do to help. I was one of the very few Western people who had direct access to King Hussein. He in return, he in return was one of the very few people that Saddam trusted. We could cut out all the angry people in the middle and perhaps King Hussein could talk to Saddam and put my suggestion to him. I called Queen Noor and asked if she, would, she could help with my plan. Come on out and stay with us, Richard. You can discuss it with the king yourself, she said. In Jordan, yet again, I spent three days talking to King Hussein. He agreed that something must be done quickly before, some, before things got worse. I sat down and with a lot of care 
wrote a very polite letter by hand to Saddam. I asked if he would release all the foreigners who were trapped in Iraq. To show goodwill, I would fly in medical supplies that Iraq was short of. I signed it. You were respectfully Richard Branson. After dinner that night, the king took my letter to his study and translated it into Arabic. He also wrote his own personal cover letter to Saddam and sent it by special courier to Iraq. I could do more and I could do no more and flew home. Two nights later, I heard from King Hussein it was very good news. Saddam said that women and children, but he wanted someone of stature to fly to Iraq and asked him in person on TV. I phoned Sir Edward Hill, the former Prime Minister. We got on well because of our mutual interests in both. Very bravely, he agreed to go at once. The plan was to stay with the royal family. From there, he would get safe passage to Iraq. A day later, King Hussein phoned me. I have got news for you, sir. You can set off for Iraq. I have, I have Saddam's word that you will be safe. I had one major worry before I set off. In spite of King Hussein's promise, many expected Saddam to take me and Edward Heath hostage and impound the plan. Because of the risk, we had no insurance. If Saddam did seize the plane, we would go bust. I was risking everything on this venture, but too many people depended on me. There was no backing out. When we left Iraq with hostages and Edward Heath safely on board, we were so relieved all the way back. But one person wasn't happy. The boss of British BA said, Who the hell does Richard Branson think he is part of the bloody foreign office? After I wrote in my diary what are the motives for doing such things, a month ago I was at on all-time low. I seem to have run out of purpose in my life. I'd proved, I, it pro, I've proved myself in many area, areas. I just turned 40. I was seeking a new challenge. When I reread what I had written, I realized that as a businessman, I could do a great deal of good. The rescue mission to Iraq had proved it. As a businessman, I met incredible phone people like Nelson Mandela, world leaders like the Russian Premier and people of West wealth like Bill Gates and Microsoft listener known to co-founder Paul Allen. In fact, people in business in the very wealthy are in unique position. They can connect with everyone, whether high or low, in any country, though a network of goodwill. I believe they can use the power wisely for the good of the world, exactly as I said my, in my first ever student column. My daughter Holly, who is a medical student, is interested in the sexual issues for facing young people in the UK. We have come full circle from where I started out in the world. As she volunteers when she came at Virgin Unite and contact us at Portobello Road in West London if they need consoling. My original love, music, is also a strong force for good. You only have to look at Live Aid and Live It and the incredible work that people like Peter Grebel, Bono and Bob guilt of in raising money from famine relief and other disasters in the third world to see that. Princess Diana did so much for charity when she was alive and I was pleased to be able to help her with that in some small way. So I was very proud when I persuaded Elton John to sing Candle in the Wind at her funeral. The record sold a third 33 million copies worldwide in mid 20 million pounds this was all given to charity exactly as Diana would have wished in 2004 I brought myself closer to my vision of helping more people by setting up Virgin Unite it is intended a way of getting all the Virgin staff around the world to work together to help with tough social problems I hope we can continue to make a difference the end of chapter 9 Epilogue I have always lived my life to be thriving on chances and adventure. The motive that drives me has always been set to myself challenges and try to achieve them. 
Every lesson I have learned has been as a direct result of these tests. They include just do it, think yes, not no, challenge yourself, have goals, have fun, make a difference, stand on your own feet, be loyal, live life to the full. The best the best time of the day for me is evening, at a necker seated around a big happy table with my family and friends having fun. This paradise island combines many of my dreams and aims in life. When Juan and I first found this island, buying it became a goal. Raising the money and building a house on it, then getting water in and where huge tests to be passed. I never once said can't. I went for it and we did it. Today it's a place where my family and friends and I have a lot of fun. It's where I relax and think and where some of my best ideas come out of the blue. I have to keep an open mind to see their virtue. I started to play tennis more on Necker. It's good to concentrate on the game and think of nothing else. Having learned to focus with, without my mind wandering and after many years of avoiding books, I started reading more about 9 years ago. I have always read but not heavy books, but, but I was surprised and pleased at how quickly I got going. I speed read but, I thanks, uh, but thanks to my early problems at school, observe it all. I don't allow myself to trip over slow or tricky words, but get the meaning from the flow and sense of the section. Now that, I'm, now that I have started reading, re has become a great ple pleasure. I like history books best, which has led to my interest in archaeology. At the moment, I am founding a dive off the coast of Egypt to survey the ancient of Alexandria. My favorite books are Sterling Grade by Anthony Beaver and Wild Swans by Jiang Shang. But I still can't use a laptop. People have given me a Blackberry and mobile phones, but I have always written everything down in school notebooks. It started when I found reading and writing hard at school and to make up for that, built up a very good long-term memory. Now I jot down keywords in my notebooks and later, if I need to, I find a note and I call, I recall retired conversations. This has stood me in a very good state more than once when I needed to prove something. But it's not just conversations. I also jot down my own thoughts. Anything I see in here can spark in an idea in me. I note it down at once and often look back through old notebooks to gain fresh ideas or to see what I have missed. I would advise young people starting out in life to keep a notebook with them. It's a good habit to go into. I still believe in all the tasks my mother set us, but have applied them to a lesser degree with my own children, Holly and Sam. They live in the modern world, but like me, they were brought up to challenge themselves. I encourage them, but never push them. Joan is a very down-to-earth Scottish woman. She made sure that we were always around other family members. We live a very sad, stable, normal life, and as a result, Holly and Sam are very well balanced. All the things in this book are lessons, are my lessons in my goals in life. The things I believe in, but they are not unique to me. Everyone needs. To keep learning everyone needs goals each and every one of my lessons can be applied to all of us whatever we want to be and whatever we want to do we can do it go ahead take that first step just do it the end of this book thank you